welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of Call Me Star from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled My Life Was Saved by a Dogman Hunter. Let's get straight into that. I was heading back into town with my buddy Joe after spending a weekend out on a frozen lake, ice fishing and drinking beer. The fish were really biting too, and Joe's SUV was stuffed to the gills with walleye and smallmouth bass. The northerly town of Kapuskasin was buried under a mountain of snow, the worst snowfall since the winter of 97. I've lived my entire life in northern Ontario, and so I've seen my fair share of snow, but nothing like this. But you learn to expect the unexpected in northern Ontario. We were heading over a steep incline, enjoying a generous backdrop of pine trees painted in freshly fallen snow when tragedy struck. We watched as two police helicopters landed on a small slice of highway, causing the trickles of traffic to grind to a halt. Not a good sign. This highway was the only road home. We later learned that a newlywed couple had collided with a transport truck, killing both the husband and wife. We were forced to turn around and head back over the hill, where we found ourselves driving through the modest-sized hamlet consisting of one stop sign, a gas station slash motel slash restaurant, plus a smattering of wartime houses. Except all you could see was the pointed rooftops. The houses were completely submerged in snow. It was an incredible sight, something you only see this far up north, and even then, this was rare. Joe didn't want to stick around, waiting a good 12 hours for the road to clear. He had a wife and kids to get home to, and so we pulled over, wondering what our next move should be. Joe had that look in his eye, the look he gets when he's about to do something dangerous or stupid, or both. I know this look well. Hang tight, he said, and hold on. We turned onto a crude version of a road, the kind designated for snowmobiles, with stop signs standing a mere three feet tall. The road was extremely narrow, Snowbanks as high as trees were towering over us like large, looming walls of white. If anything were to approach, we'd have nowhere to go. There wasn't enough room to turn around. Now it's becoming increasingly uneasy. This is how people get hurt, or worse. Are you sure this is safe? I asked, hating the sound of my voice. And Joe ignored me, or simply didn't hear me. He was busy white-knuckling the minivan through the snow-tunneled trail. The glare of the setting sun blinded us the entire time. And we drove for 15 minutes, knifing our way along the icy road, which was bumpier than a wooden roller coaster. It was obvious that we shouldn't be here. The impending darkness didn't improve my mood one bit either. I had a bad feeling about this. And Joe stopped the van. What's up? I asked, not trusting a look on his face. And Joe didn't answer. I could see his mind at work, assessing the dryness of our situation. I gotta turn this thing around somehow, he finally said. I couldn't see how this was possible, as we were sandwiched between two colossal snowbanks, and something flickered inside Joe's dark eyes. What's that up ahead? He asked, flashing on the high beams. I think it's a road. It was. We edged a bit further, stopping at this makeshift road. But there were no signs or road markings to be seen. Nothing. In fact, this road looked worse than the one we were on. Ah, uh, let's see where it goes. Joe said, cranking the wheel. And as the miniman lumbered down the unmarked road, an ominous feeling swept over me. It was impossible to ignore. We were in trouble. Well, there was no denying it. We were completely off the grid. Not even Google Maps could save us. And there was only one way to go. Straight. The road was leading us into the dark of the forest, and when you're this far north, that's never a good idea. Especially at night. That's when the wolves come out. It was looking to be a moonless night, which didn't help us one bit. 
and Joe's hands were quivering as he clenched a wheel, keeping us from skidding into the tower and snowbank. He kept assuring me we'd be all right, but I've heard that one before. And Joe slammed on the bricks. You see that? He pointed. Over there. I squinted my eyes. Look, he said. Fire. Deep in the forest, I spotted a small flicker in flame, dancing blue and orange and yellow and wild. Probably a campfire. And just then, a strange and disturbing sound crackled through the night like a howling wolf. You hear that? He asked. The animal cried out again. It was the loneliest yowl you've ever heard. There it goes again. It sounded like a wolf, except it didn't sound like any wolf I'd ever heard before, and I've heard plenty. And whatever it was, it was dangerously close. Uh, wolf? I said nervously, but not believing it. And as soon as those words left my mouth, a pair of glowing red eyes appeared out of nowhere. Joe stopped the car and killed the lights. Be still, he said. I did just that. I sat motionless beside him in the car, but my hands were shaking. Those laser red eyes were approaching at an impossible speed. Reach back and grab the gun, Joe whispered. I tried, but it was out of reach. They were on his side, closer to the back. Those glowing eyes flashed on and off, and for a moment... Everything was still. Then, from out of nowhere, the beast lunged onto the hood of the van. Wah! We both screamed in unison. The thing was huge, unlike any animal I'd ever seen. It looked like an overgrown German shepherd, except that it was standing on its hind legs like a human. It was snarling at us and making ungodly noises, thrashing about. The creature was long and gangly, throffing at the mouth and clearly rabid. Dark man, Joe said, clearly astonished. I don't believe it. Joe gunned it, looking to run the thing over and speed away, but the wheels were caught on ice. Without warning, the beast leapt off the hood and started scratching at my door, its claws like daggers tearing the door from its hinges. It smashed through the windshield, shattering it into a million pieces. And with its dog-like face twisted in rage, the thing took a swipe at me. Its long, toothy claws just inches from ripping my eyeballs from their sockets. And the SUV shook, spilling the cooler of dead fish. And the smell was atrocious. The dogman disagreed. Before I could rip apart my throat with its curvy claws, the creature turned from me and trampled to the back of the van, where it devoured the fish in seconds flat. Its muzzle turned blood red, Watching it lick the fish guts from its paws, I was sickening. This, this isn't how I wanted to die. The dogman's razor-sharp teeth were on full display. The insidious brute seemed hell-bent on killing us both, and we were in fact the main course. It took a tentative step towards us, licking its filthy face. I gave Joe a look that said, Nice knowing you, pal, when out of nowhere came an ear-ringing blast striking the creature in the shoulder. The thing screamed in protest, and then came another shot, hitting the beast square in the chest. Blood and gore spilled like wine across the interior of the SUV. Someone's shooting at it, Joe proclaimed. Three more shots rang out, and the creature snarled, wiped the fleshy cartilage from its bloodied face, and then attacked. Bang! The shot went wide, but it was enough to send the beast scurrying, back into the woods. Holy hell, Joe said in a shaky voice. And without a second thought, he pulled his seat back as far as it would go and then shimmered his way into the back of the van and grabbed the gun. We're gonna need this. All of a sudden, it was freezing. With the vehicle off and the windshield busted in, it was an igloo inside the van. Oh, it's getting cold in here, eh? I said, shaking uncontrollably. A large plume of steam escaped from my face as I spoke. I was in shock. I had no idea what that thing was, but it damn near killed me. The scene inside of the minivan was that out of a horror movie. The smell was even worse. I tried opening a door, but it wouldn't budge. Joe tried his door with the same results. 
we were stuck. I'd sliced myself to shreds before I got halfway through my windshield. Joe's door had a bullet hole where the handle should be. We'd have to escape through the back, blood and guts and fish bones and all. It was gruesome, but we did it. Once outside, we scanned the area, searching for that dog creature that almost killed me, but it had vanished. Joe's shotgun was aimed at a speck of light approaching from straight ahead. A car. Within minutes, we were greeted by a Volkswagen microbus. It stopped directly in front of us. The driver got out and ran towards us, carrying a sniper rifle and wearing a belt of ammunition. He spoke fast and with purpose, checking his surrounding while doing so. You saw it? You did, didn't you? <laughs> Excellent. Which way did it go, by the way? This guy made Clint Eastwood look like a boy scout. I honestly thought he was going to kill us. He frowned as he surveyed the scene, and then he shrugged. Well, I suppose you been needing my help. He ran to the bus and opened up the hatch, exposing an array of military-style weapons to the likes I'd only seen in movies. Holy hell, Joe said, clearly impressed. And I remained quiet, unsure of what to make of this heavily armed, red-headed stranger who literally just appeared out of nowhere to save our lives. But there seemed to be no other choice. Whoever he was, he drove us back to his cottage, regarding us with a history of this dogman creature. He told us some pretty tall tales. Now his name was Patrick. Apparently, he was a dogman hunter. He says he'd never captured one, but claims to have seen four or five and wounded two of them. Pesky bastards, he said. Hard to kill. Now, he'd been hunting the one that attacks us for weeks. Apparently, it's been mutilating deer and coyotes, as well as regular cats and dogs all winter long, and leaving their salvaged remains scattered along the sides of the road and in people's backyards. The locals were starting to panic. Joe and I texted home. Then we stayed up all night talking about Dogman. I was having a hard time coming to grips with all of this, seeing as how I almost died at the hands of one of them. And Joe, on the other hand, was enthralled. The next day we drove back to the SUV to inspect the damage. When we arrived the van was completely dismantled and destroyed. It lay in ruins. Everything inside of it had been ravaged and plundered. This isn't right, Patrick said. It must be an explanation. We scanned the surrounding area for over an hour and came up empty-handed. A fresh blanket of snow had fallen overnight, making track finding next to it impossible. The disappointment on Patrick's face was palpable. Reluctantly, we hopped into his microbus and he drove us home with our towels between our legs, where we arrived a day late and short of one SUV. We stayed in touch with Patrick going forward, and Joe, coming from a long lineage of seasoned hunters, was intrigued by this dogman creature. Naturally, I was sceptical. I am fairly certain that that beast meant to eat me. The last thing I wanted to do was volunteer to go searching for it. Yet, unbeknownst to me, this was the making of a team of hunters. Dogman hunters. Still, amidst all the excitement, a feeling of trepidation had stolen over me. There was a lesson to be learned from all of this. A lesson lost on my gun-toting counterparts. Some roads are best untravelled, especially in northern Ontario where anything can happen, and usually does. The creature in the woods came back with tragic results. Let's get straight into that. Many months had passed since I was nearly pulverised by the creature in the woods. I was with my buddy Joe when it happened, up in northern Ontario. We've gotten ourselves lost in the dark of the forest, where monsters are known to prowl in the shadows of towering trees. Up here, monsters exist. Ultimately, it was Patrick who saved us. Patrick had been tracking a thing for weeks prior to saving our hides. And according to him, the creature is a result of a top-secret government experiment dating back to the 1940s. He claims there are others, but none as dangerous as a dogman. We searched high and low for the creature in the woods, but to no avail. 
by the end of March, a band of dogman hunters grew weary. Surely the beast was dead. The northerly town of Kapuskasen enjoyed a brief period of normality. No more missing kittens, no more mutilated animal carcasses discarded in people's yards or left on the side of the road for the crows to pick apart. Life moved on and people forgot. Unfortunately, we did too. We let our guard down and it cost us big time. We had become fast friends. Hanging out at Patrick's cabin by the lake was a nice pastime on long weekends. Last weekend was no different, except, of course, it was different. It was a complete catastrophe. Eh, grab us some firewood, Patrick said. Him and Joe were huddled by the campfire, warming their hands over the flickering flames and drinking beer. The evening was cool and breezy. The grass was wet from the previous night's rainfall. The moon hung like a bowling ball, big and round and full of holes. I forced myself off the patio chair and went in search of firewood. Behind the cabin, near in the rim of the forest, I caught a whiff of something foul. A mixture of grease and wet fur. I gagged. Figuring it was a bear, I picked up the pace. The last thing I wanted was to be bear food. Something shot through the dense woodland, a stone's throw from where I was standing, making my hair stand on end. Then it released a desperate howl. The sound filled me with dread. That's no bear. I scanned the vicinity, cursing myself for not bringing a flashlight. All I could see was the lake and forest. The feeling that I was being watched was impossible to ignore. And twigs snapped. I spun around like a superhero. And two laser red eyes were peering at me through the thick of the brush. Dogman. And I scampered back to camp like a scared puppy. Patrick was yammering on about his precious haps and why they'd do better next year. Well, he was furious. Never miss with a French Canadian when it comes to hockey, especially when you're dealing with the Montreal Canadiens. Guys, I said dropping the wood in front of the fire, and Patrick ignored me, and I tried my luck with Joe. Joe, I cried, something's out there. Well, that caught their attention. In this part of the world, when someone utters that phrase, you better take notice. Well, Joe and Patrick sat upright, and before I could get another word in, the creature in the woods howled again. The sound ricocheted off the frigid lake like a fresh breeze. It sounded close. Ah, oh, crap. Patrick slurred, his face twisted in torment. This man who prides himself on being prepared, which none of us were at that moment. Joe, he snapped. Go grab the guns. And Joe stood up abruptly, the lawn chair stuck to his backside, like something out of a Winnie the Pooh movie. He stumbled and fell face first onto the soggy ground. Not his shining moment. Patrick cursed in French. Ah, fine. I'll do it myself. He said and hovered towards his heavily armed micro bus. And something growled, deep and guttural. Joe shot me a look that said, oh, Let's go. And we raced to the safety of the cabin, slamming the door behind us. Oh, Patrick, better hurry. Joe said, gasping for air. His face looked like milk. We skidded to the window, which overlooked the driveway. Patrick was fumbling for his keys, trying to unlock the hatch. He dropped the keys. One could imagine a cocktail of cuss words coming from his mouth at that moment. Nobody swears like the French. Our beaten heart sounded like bombs in the otherwise dead silent cabin. Our eyes were glued to Patrick, who retrieved his precious car keys. And as Patrick was opening the trunk, something lunged in front of the cabin window. Wah! We screamed in unison. Dog man. The beast... It was hideous. It scowled at us through the frosted glass, exposing an artillery of jagged white teeth. Its muzzle drenched in drool, and it stood on its muscular hind legs, flexing its jangly claws inches from our faces. I gasped. This was the dogman that nearly tore me to shreds a few months earlier. And the door handle turned as the creature clawed at the cabin door, trying to get inside. The beast roared, sending shivers down my spine. Then it crashed into the door. Once again, my life flashed before my eyes. The creature in the woods had come back, and now it was going to finish me off. Shots rang out, sounding like a million volts of thunder. And Joe and I dropped to the floor and ate dust. Outside, Patrick was whooping and hollering and cussing in French. 
and Joe stood up and peeked outside. The look he gave me wasn't encouraging. More shots were fired, and I shot to my feet like a firecracker. Patrick's infamous Chuck Norris grin was plastered across his freckled face. In his hands was a semi-automatic rifle. The dog-like creature jumped on top of the microbus, screaming in protest. And before Patrick could take aim, the beast flew off the van and tackled him to the ground. No! I cried out. Terror enveloped me. My hands were shaking. My legs were butter. Joe grabbed the 12-gauge shotgun off of the wall. He cocked it, and then using the butt of the weapon, he smashed through the window and pointed the weapon. Damn it, he said. I can't get a line on the thing. Meanwhile, Patrick was being mauled. The menacing mutt had pinned him to the ground and was tearing him to shreds. The creature's face was a bloodied mess. Its claws clenched around Patrick's neck and squeezing the life out of him. Patrick, reaching desperately for his weapon, was covered head to toe in scratches. Fury found me. If this creature thinks it can feast on my friend, well, it's got another thing coming. I found a Smith & Wesson lying on top of Patrick's dresser. I would have to do. I opened a cabin door, took aim, and fired. BAM! The creature collapsed head first on top of Patrick, who quickly then freed himself. He found his semi-automatic and went berserk. And Joe and I stood transfixed as a bouquet of bullets pulverized the dogman. Blood and guts and entrails exploded from his chest like spaghetti hidden in a fan, covering the beast head to toe in gore. And the creature shrieked. Its crimson teeth glistened under the pale moonlight. It took a tentative step back, wiped the blood from its muzzle, and then attacked. And with one quick swipe, the beast tore off Patrick's left arm. Pat! Joe proclaimed. And Joe rushed outside and shot the creature in the back. Patrick fell from its grip like a sack of stones. And the beast was caked in red. It looked at Joe and charged. And Joe flew into the cabin head first, making it just in the nick of time. The cabin door groaned as the beast slammed into it. The door was on its last legs. Patrick was crying for help. Oh, we gotta save him, I said in between bouts of hysteria. Joe was trembling. He'd nearly been dogman food. I know that feeling. The animal was clawing at the door and grunting. The freezer, I said. Of course, Joe said, reading my mind. Dogs like food, especially meat. Something this cabin has plenty of. I found a pack of frozen moose steaks from the freezer. The creature was crouched over Patrick, ready to finish him off. And I whistled, still in its attention, and then tossed the meat out of the door. The beast started sniffing the offering. Its tongue was dripping with blood. Patrick's blood. The dogman raised its ugly head, and then it attacked the steaks like a hungry bear. Meanwhile, Patrick's intestines spilled across his blood-stained sweater as his lifeless body lay on sodden soil, next to an arm that moments ago belonged to him. The monster was gnawing away on the frozen flesh, grunting and groaning. The sound, it was sickening. And Joe cocked and fired. The shot went wide. Damn it! He said, shaking his head in dismay. The dog creature dropped the meat and looked at me with venom. I shot the thing square between its eyes. Kablam! Blood exploded from the beast head in every direction. I fired again, hitting it in the leg. By now I was fuming. Vengeance was mine. The creature dropped to its knees. Fresh blood ran down its face. My eyes darted towards Patrick, who was barely hanging on by a threat. Miraculously, he managed to prop himself up against the back of the van. He was panting. Blood was pouring out of him like wet paint. The creature cried out, sending a wave of chills down my spine. And something called back. And then another. There were others. There must be more of them. I said, barely recognizing the sound of my voice. The howling continued. A pack of dogmen filled the endless night with their song. And Joe came up behind me. His eyes told me everything I needed to know. On three, he whispered. And Joe counted. And on three, the door swung open. Joe and I jumped outside, shooting the beast again and again, its body obliterated by the onslaught of ammunition. The dogman floundered, but somehow held its ground. 
And finally, as our attack persisted, the creature retreated back into the thick of the forest, leaving a trail of blood and matted fur behind. Suddenly, the world went still. Patrick whimpered. He needs a doctor, I said, and fast. Joe called 911 while I stood next to Patrick, holding his one and only hand. It was iceberg cold. He was leaking a tremendous amount of blood. His eyes were barely open, his breathing shallow. And Joe arrived with first aid. We tended to Patrick the best we could, but his prospects, well, they weren't good. This far north, ambulances are not waiting around the corner. They don't come on a whim. It took an hour before the helicopter arrived. Patrick was flown to the nearest hospital. The cops showed up soon thereafter and with a boatload of questions. Apparently, they were actually aware of this dogman creature and have been for quite some time. This didn't make me feel any better. The thing was still lurking in the forest, not far from where we were standing. Joe and I sat around the fire until the sun came up. There was no sleep for us that night. We tried to convince ourselves that Patrick would be fine, or well, he's the toughest guy we knew. If anyone could survive an assault of that magnitude, well, that's him. Meanwhile, we kept a close eye on the edge of the forest, waiting for the creature from the woods to return. Patrick called the following day. Sadly, the doctors couldn't save his arm, but they did save his life. He seemed in good spirits, but was heavily sedated, and unable to talk for long. Now the weight of the world fell from our shoulders. I wouldn't worry too much about Patrick, knowing him, he's plotting his revenge as a type this. I suddenly wouldn't put it past him. Now word travels fast in the north. The town of Campus Kaysen was once again placed on high alert. People prepared. There are creatures in the woods. Creatures that rip limbs from your body. Creatures that sink their teeth into your flesh and claw at your throat. Not just one, there are others. That said, there's only one monster on my mind as I finish typing the story. The creature who came back from the forest. Dogman. There are creatures in North Ontario. Creatures that kill. Let's get straight into that. Well, someone went down faster then a cold beer on a warm night. Work stole most of my time, and I miss my friends dearly. Since Patrick's incident, resulting in a loss of his arm to a seven-foot-tall dog-like creature, we'd gone our separate ways. The merry band of dogman hunters were no more. Joe, my lifelong friend, spent the summer with his family. He works from home and took full advantage. By all accounts, his summer went swimmingly. And Patrick, a foul-mouthed French-Canadian who enjoys hunting with military-grade weapons, had his arm ripped off by a dogman creature earlier this year. I saw it happen. Needless to say, Patrick kept to himself all summer, recuperating from his life-threatening injury. Then, to my surprise, Patrick called me the other day. He had plenty to say. Turns out he was dating his nurse. Her name is Cindy. She had heard all about me and Joe and our adventures as dogman hunters, and was eager to finally meet us in person. Thus, Joe and I were invited to spend the weekend his cabin. Beers and barbecues and good fishing. Just like old times. I happily agreed. My stress level was at an all-time high. I needed to get away. And to my amazement, Joe also agreed. You see, after our second brush with death, well, Joe was forbidden to see me or Patrick again. His wife told him so. For his own safety, she said, and for the safety of their children. That said, Joe's wife was taking the kids to see their grandparents for the weekend. What she didn't know wouldn't hurt her, right? We loaded Joe's SUV with beer and fresh meat. We spoke nonsensically, avoiding the gory details of our previous trip to Patrick's cabin by the lake. The drive, I was treacherous. In the backwash of northern Ontario, one wrong turn could cost you your life. And Patrick greeted us with an open arm. His ruggedly handsome face exuded confidence. He introduced us to Cindy. And to my amazement, she wore more camouflage than he did. She looked as tough as raw hide. A t-shirt said, Guns don't kill people, I do. Well, it was mid-afternoon. A cool breeze was wafting off the lake. The sky was a sea of blue, the leaves turning orange and candy apple red. And soon, the four of us were sitting by the lake, 
sipping ice-cold beer and telling stories. Patrick was trying his darndest to conceal his excitement. Well, he's a proud man, but he was happy to have the gang back together. Cindy was full of questions. Pat tells me you boys hunt dogman creatures. Joe spat his bear out. He shifted in his seat, but remained silent. I gave a weary thumbs up, having nearly been pulverized by the creature in the woods. I don't broach the subject lightly. And before she could get another word in, Patrick spoke up. Come, have a look at this. He said, grinning ear to ear. He led us into the cabin, which was cluttered with weapons and traps and concoctions I'd never seen before. I'm no gun expert, but I knew those weapons were illegal. Look, there. Patrick pointed to the corner of the room. I shrieked. I did it. Patrick boasted. We did it, Cindy said, elbowing him playfully in the ribs. Next to the handmade coffee table, standing a good seven feet tall, was the creature that ripped Patrick's left arm off. The dogman, stuffed like a Thanksgiving duck. Its lifeless eyes followed my every move. Its razor-sharp claws were a cruel reminder of how close I came to becoming dogman food. And Patrick, <laughs> he was beaming. Kill the son of a bitch last week. Oh, you should have seen it, Cindy said, holding Patrick's hand. Oh, it was great. And Patrick made me touch his matted fur. It took incredible willpower not to soil myself. We retreated to the lake. All the while, Patrick and Cindy regaled us with their latest adventure, the story of how they captured and killed an actual dogman. We set up cameras around the cabin, Cindy told us. We had to, Patrick interrupted. The bastard wouldn't leave us alone. Joe tossed me a beer. Check this out. Patrick held up a noose. It was as ugly as the dogman creature standing in the living room. Killed him with this. <laughs> Of course. Joe said crack and open a fresh can. He was on the edge of his seat. Well, Joe loves to hunt. It's in his DNA. He comes from a lineage of skilled hunters, in fact. Well, he could skin a bear faster than you could say dogman hunters. And Patrick filled us in. They had set up traps around the cabin. Last week, while sleeping, they were startled by a terrible noise coming from outside. Dogman. Patrick grabbed his sword-off shotgun and peeked outside. And sure enough, the creature was creeping around the yard, going through the garbage. With the gun mounted to his one and only arm, he went out after it. Meanwhile, Cindy snuck around the back. And the dogman approached Patrick, looking to finish him off once and for all. Cindy approached from the rear, carrying a bucket full of deer meat, and she whistled. The creature turned and charged. Cindy dropped the meat into the center of the trap, which lay on the ground, attached to a tree. And as the brute wrapped its eager claws around the stake, the trap sprung to life. The beast was swooped into the air, entangled in thick mesh and dangling violently from a tree. The beast growled and groaned, kicking and clawing and trying desperately to escape. Patrick approached without caution. This was the moment he'd been dreaming of long before losing his limb. He had been trying to capture this creature for years, and he finally did it. With the help of Cindy, of course. Pete the thing black and blue, Cindy snickered. Then we wrapped the noose around its ugly head, Patrick interrupted. Snapped his neck like a twig, Cindy added. It died right before our eyes. I sure did, Cindy smiled. Patrick and Cindy were sitting side by side, staring lovingly into each other's eyes. To them, this was romance. I cringed. My appetite was gone. How did I get talked into this? I looked at Joe for support and found none. Joe, huh, he was enthralled. Once he gets excited about something, no one, not even his beautiful wife and loving family, can discourage him. And a beer flowed like wine. By dinner, we'd heard the story more times than I'd seen Blade Hunter. Patrick swore us to secrecy, and word travels fast up north. Cindy fired up the barbecue, and soon our buddies were full of burgers, baked potatoes, and garden fresh greens. And trouble arrived at sunset. And Joe and I insisted on cleaning up. I did the dishes, and Joe put everything away. When we returned outside, the fire was roaring. The sun was sinking low. The night, I was chilly. And so we wrapped ourselves in flannel and warm blankets. And as Patrick began telling his story, uh, yet again, an ominous cry crashed through the night. It was the loneliest sound I'd ever heard. Then came another from across the lake. Dogman. 
Patrick said through clenched teeth. Two of them. He nodded to Cindy, who skidded inside the cabin and returned with weapons. When she dropped a semi-automatic onto my lap, I flew from my seat like a firecracker. Unlike my gun-toting companions, I don't do semi-automatics. And Patrick cursed at me. Cindy nodded disapprovingly and then gave me a handgun. I looked as small as a flea. Joe gladly accepted his firearm and checked to see if it was loaded. It was. Meanwhile, the cooler remained heavily stuck and the campfire raged on, providing much needed light. The curious cries continued, like a symphony of lonesome laments. The solitary glow of the crescent moon filled me with discontent. I shivered. The sounds were getting closer. Something was growling from the edge of the woods. And I turned, and a pair of bloodshot eyes were peering at me. Get inside, Cindy ordered. Joe and I stared stupidly at one another. Now! And we went. The cabin greeted us like a mischief of rats. We scurried to the window. Without warning, a large dog-like creature lunged in front of us, baring its teeth. Its snout was thick with foam, its claws crashing through the window with one strong swipe. A deafening shot rang out, and we hit the floor, when everything went dark. My ears were ringing, my mind in disarray. Globs of blood dripped onto the floor like wet paint. Dogman blood. I gagged. Joe then jumped to his feet. Over here, he whispered. Joe crouched next to the door, rifle in hand, and shaking. Patrick whooped and hollered, calling a dogman every name in the book, and then some. And a crowd of creatures responded. The grisly growls echoed off the lake for miles. How many of them are there? Joe gasped, peeking out the door. I shrugged. Honestly, I didn't want to know. We were in the middle of nowhere. Out here, there were no neighbours. No one to rescue us. We were on our own. Joe gave me a nod before rushing outside, weapon first. No! Patrick spat. Joe was ambushed. The pack of creatures had him surrounded. Patrick shot one in the back, and the beast bellowed, releasing a blood-curdling cry that made my skin crawl. I hurried outside. Darkness devoured me. The flickering fire was now a smouldering speck of soot. The fingernail moon vanished. The sky was darker than death. Meanwhile, Patrick was perched in a tree, blanketing the beasts with bullets. Joe wailed in agony as the mangy mutts mauled him, and shots were fired. Get out of the way, Cindy shouted. She was close, but I couldn't see her. Footsteps approached, and I swung around, and Dogman was charging. Its breathing sounded like a sputtering motorcycle. I jumped inside the cabin just in time. There's four of them, Patrick shouted. One of them has Joe. My courage was floundering, but I soldiered on. I aimed my lowly hang on outside the shattered window. The beast had Joe in its grip. Without hesitating, I squeezed the trigger. Bam! I hit a thing in the shoulder. At the same time, Patrick fired, blowing a hole in its hind leg. The beast buckled. Joe sprang to his feet and fired point blank, hitting his assailant right between the eyes. Blood and brains exploded, covering him head to toe. And Cindy came charging. She scooped Joe into her muscular arms and then retreated to the shed, barely avoiding a wrath of the menacing monster treading close behind. Listen up, Patrick shouted from the treetop. When I give the word, go to the shed. Again, I score myself for being here. Apparently, spending a relaxing weekend with powers was too much to ask. Now! My eyes focused on the shed. A stone's throw from the cabin. Now, God damn it! Patrick's voice slapped me in the face, and I ran, got on it towards the shed, screaming my head off. The race, I was on. Creatures were nipping at my heels. I twisted and turned, narrowly avoiding their grasp. Cindy was egging me on, shouting, Go, go, go! When I ran as fast as I could, but it wasn't quick enough. One of them then grabbed my shoulder, digging its claws deep into my flesh. I pried it off of me, and then dove head first into the shed, the door slamming shut behind me. The creatures crashed into the shed. They were relentless in their rebuttal. The rickety door was all that separated us, and it was taken a beating. The door belched as the beast banged into it again and again. We were trapped. My shoulder was a mess, 
my bloodstained sweater torn to shreds, and Cindy quickly patched up my wounds. The pain was egregious. Ah, you'll be fine, she snapped. Hold still. I did. And Cindy bandaged my wound using a dusty rag. Then she found her phone and started punching keys. Her determination? Huh, it was remarkable. She was like the woman from the Terminator movies, or only French. And someone touched my shoulder and I screamed in agony. Joe looked haggard, far worse than me. Blood and bruises and scratches galore. His wounds were deep, his water bucket eyes barely open. Clearly he needed a doctor. This is it, old oh buddy, he managed to say. This is the end. My heart sank. I'd known Joe my entire life. We'd been best friends for as long as I could remember. This isn't how it was supposed to end. Oh no, Cindy shook her head. Nobody dies on my watch, and her phone vibrated. Hang tight, she ordered. Gunshots rang like rockets. Patrick was going ballistic. Hey, flea bags, want some of this? And Cindy smiled. All at once she was beautiful. Then she jumped outside and attacked, firing round after round, screaming bloody murder. Rifle blasts and curse words filled the dead of the night. I peeked outside, and what I saw still haunts me. Patrick was luring the creatures into his cabin. Mounds of meat carpeted the cabin floor. The beasts were like a pack of hyenas, gorging on the feast. Meanwhile, Cindy was open firing, except she wasn't hitting them. She was aiming wide, avoiding the cabin. And then I noticed the makeshift box in Patrick's hand, silver and clunky, and with an antenna poking out at the end. Cindy stopped firing as Patrick joined her. They shared a quick embrace, and then Patrick pressed down on a red button. Blam! The entire cabin was blown to smithereens. The sheer force of the blast sent me flying. The dogman creatures didn't know what hit them, and the world, well, it went still. My body and mind shut down. I lay motionless for an undisclosed amount of time, and took a strong hand, then picked me up. Are you okay? Cindy asked. I was dazed and confused, unable to respond. I hurt everywhere. You see that? Patrick bellowed, bobbing up and down. Woohoo! And Cindy helped Joe into the microbus, where he was rushed to the hospital. When I say rushed, I use that term loosely. This far north, a two-hour drive is considered a quick jaunt. I went with them, and Patrick stayed behind, keeping a close eye on the wreckage. Cindy boasted the entire trip. Turns out they'd been preparing for this all summer. They simply forgot to inform us that Patrick's cabin was stuffed with explosives. The plan was to lure the creatures into the cabin and then blow them straight to hell. I didn't bother explaining how dangerous and stupid their plan was. I was too tired. And besides, the plan worked. Now my wounds were minor. I got off lucky. Joe, not so lucky. The nurses asked plenty of questions, and Cindy was prepared for this. A bear attack, she said flatly. Well... When all else fails, blame the bears. When it worked. Joe was stitched up and released the following week. Needless to say, his wife was not impressed. Fortunately, she's a forgiven woman. And Joe is doing everything possible to make it up to her. I think he'll be alright. They've been through this before. Although, I doubt I'll ever see him again. Patrick and Cindy moved to North Bay. They've opened an ammunition shop specialising in hunting extraordinary creatures. The store is called Beasts by the Bay. Patrick kept a dogman's head as a souvenir and proudly displayed it behind the counter. While his tall tales loom large in his legend. Me? Not much has changed. I went back to work Tuesday morning and nobody was the wiser. My workmates know nothing of my adventures as a dogman hunter. And to them, I'm a quiet yet responsible worker. Someone who shows up on time keeps to himself and rarely complains. They didn't even notice my injuries. And the northerly town of Kapuskasen has quietened down again. The random slain of small animals has subsided. For now. The forecast is calling for snow by the end of the week. A long and arduous winter is expected. And what will become of the dogman? Only time will tell. My guess is they'll migrate further north, but they'll remain undetected 
for years. You see, these creatures, well, they adapt. They feed. They kill. Then, they move on. May this story serve as a warning. If you're up in northern Ontario and see a creature in the woods, run away as fast as you can. Take it from someone who knows. Up here, the creatures will tear you apart, limb by limb, and feast off of your flesh. Their destruction knows no bounds. There are creatures in North Ontario. Creatures that kill. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Short but certainly packing a punch in and delivering a bite like no other cryptid can do. Big thank you to the author from over on Reddit No Sleep, Call Me Star. Look forward to any updates in this series, Star. And of course, I hope you enjoyed my rendition. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack of things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you all had a wonderful week at school or work, studying, whatever it is that you do. And I hope you're fighting fit and try to stay focused. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>